word of the battle and betrayal at Tumbleton had finally reached King's Landing. It's said that the Dowager Queen Alicent laughed when she heard, All they have sowed, now shall they reap, she promised. On the Iron Throne, Queen Rhaenyra grew pale and faint and ordered the city gates closed and barred. Henceforth, no one was to be allowed to enter or leave King's Landing. I will have no turncloaks stealing into my city to open my gates to rebels, she proclaimed. Lord Ormond's host could be outside their walls by the morning. The betrayers, Dragonborn, could arrive even sooner than that. This prospect excited Prince Joffrey. Let them come, the boy announced, flushed with arrogance of youth and eager to avenge his fallen brothers. I will meet them on Tyrax. Such talk alarmed his mother. You will not, she declared. You are too young for battle. Even so, she allowed the boy to remain as the Black Council discussed how to best deal with the approaching foe. Six dragons remained in King's Landing but only one within the walls of the Red Keep, the Queen's own she-dragon, Cyrax. A stable in the outer ward had been emptied of horses and given over for her goose. Heavy chains bound her to the ground, though long enough to allow her to move from the stable yard. The chains kept her from flying off riderless. Cyrax had long grown accustomed to chains. Exceedingly well-fed, she had not hunted for years. The other dragons were kept in the dragon pit. Beneath the great dome, 40 huge vaults had been carved into the bones of the Hill of Rainies in the Great Ring. Thick iron doors closed these man-made caves at either end of the inner doors fronting the sands of the pit. The outer, to the hillside, Caraxes, Vermithor, Silverwing and Sheepstealer had made their layers there before, flying off to battle. Five dragons remained, Prince Joffrey's Tyrax, Adam Valarian's pale grey sea smoke, the young dragons Morgul and Shyrox, bound to Princess Jehera, who was missing, and her twin brother, Prince Jeheris, who was dead, and Dreamfire, beloved the Queen Helena and Queen Raina before her. It had long been the custom for at least one dragon rider to reside in the pit, as to be able to rise in the defence of the city should the need arise. As Rhaenyra preferred to keep her sons by her side, that duty fell to Adam Valarium. But now, voices on the Black Council raised the question to Adam's loyalty. The dragon seeds of White and Hugh Hammer had gone over to the enemy, but were they the only traitors in their midst? What of Adam of Hull and the girl Nettles? They had been born of bastard stock as well. Could they be trusted? Lord Bartimus Keltegar thought not. Bastards are treacherous by nature, he said. It is in their blood. Betrayal comes easy to a bastard, as loyalty to a true-born man. He urged her grace to have the two baseborn dragon riders seized immediately before they could join with the enemy. Others echoed his view, amongst them Sir Luther Largent, commander of her city watch, and Sir Laurent Maraband, Lord Commander of her Queen's Guard. Even the two White Harbour men, the fearsome knight Sir Medric Manderley and his ever clever corporate brother Sir Torrin, urged the Queen to mistrust. Best to take no chances, Sir Torrin said. If the foe gains two more dragons, we are done. Only Lord Corlys and the Grand Maester Geraldes spoke in the defence of the dragon seats. The Grand Maester said they had no proof of any disloyalty on the part of Nettles and Sir Adam. The path of wisdom was to seek such proof before making any judgments. Lord Corliss went much further, declaring that Sir Adam and his brother Alan were true Valarians, worthy heirs to Driftmark. As for the girl, though she might be dirty and ill-favoured, she had fought valiantly at the Battle of the Gullet, as did the two betrayers. Lord Countergar countered. The hand's impassioned protest and the Grand Maester's cool caution both proved to be in vain. The Queen's suspicions had been aroused. Her grace had been betrayed so often by so many that she was quick to believe the worst of any man, Septon Eustace writes. Treachery no longer had the power to surprise her. She had come to expect it, even from those she loved the most. It might be so, yet Queen Rhaenyra did not act at once, but rather sent for Masaria, the harlot and dancing girl who was her unofficial mistress of whispers. With her skin as pale as milk, Lady Misery appeared before the council in a hooded robe of black velvet lined with blood-red silk, and stood with her head bowed humbly, as her grace asked whether she thought Sir Adam and Nettles might be planning to betray them. Then the white worm raised her eyes and said in a soft voice, The girl has already betrayed you, my queen. Even now she shares your husband's bed, and soon enough she will have his bastard in her belly. Then Queen Rhaenyra grew most wroth, Septon Eustace writes. In a voice as cold as ice, she commanded Sir Luther Largent to take twenty gold cloaks to the dragon pits and arrest Sir Adam Valarium. Question him sharply, and we will learn if he is true or false beyond doubt. As to the girl Nettles, 
She's a common thing with a stink of sorcery upon her, the queen declared. My prince would never lay with such low creatures. You need to only look at her to know she has no drop of dragon's blood in her. It was with spells she bound herself to the dragon of hers, and she has done with my lord husband. So long as he was in the girl's thrall, Prince Damon could no longer be relied upon, her grace went on. Therefore, let a command be sent at once to Maidenpool, but only for the eyes of Lord Mooden. Let him take her at table or bed and strike off her head. Only then shall my prince be freed. And thus did the betrayal beget more betrayal to the queen's undoing. As Sir Luther Largent and his gold cloaks rode up Grainese's hill with the queen's warrant, the doors of the dragon pit were thrown open above them, and sea smoke spread his pale grey wings and took flight, smoke rising from his nostrils. Sir Adam Valarian had been forewarned in time to make his escape, balked and angry, Sir so Luther returned at once to the red keep we burst into the tower of the hand and laid rough hands on the aged lord corliss accusing him of treachery nor did the old man deny it bound and beaten but still silent he was taken to the dungeon and thrown into the black cells to wait trial and execution the queen's suspicion fell upon grandmaster geraldus as well for like the sea snake he had defended the dragon seeds Geralis denied having any part in lord corliss's betrayal mindful of his long leal service to her Rhaenyra spared the Grand Maester the dungeon, but chose instead to dismiss him from her council and send him back to Dragonstone at once. I do not think you would lie to my face, she told him, but I cannot have men around me who I do not trust implicitly, and when I look at you now, all I can recall is how you pratted at me about the girl Nettles. All the while, tales of the slaughter at Tumbleton were spreading through the city, and with them, terror. King's Landing would be next men told one another dragon would fight dragon and this time the city would surely burn fearful of the coming foe hundreds tried to flee only to be turned back at the gates by the gold cloaks trapped within the city walls some sought shelter in the deep cellars against the firestorm they feared was coming whilst others turned to prayer to drink and the pleasures to be found between a woman's thighs by nightfall the city's taverns brothels and septs were full to bursting with men and women seeking solace or escape and trading tales of horror. Twas this dark hour that there rose up in a cobbler's square a certain inherited brother, barefoot scarecrow of a man in a hair shirt and a rough spun breeches, filthy and unwashed and smelling of sty, with a begging bowl hung around his neck. Grimaston Munkin suggests he may have been a poor fellow, but that order had long been outlawed. Wandering stars still haunted the byways of the Seven Kingdoms. Where he came from we cannot know. Even his name is lost to history. Those who heard him preach, like those who would later recall his infamy, knew him only as the shepherd. Mushroom names him the dead shepherd, for he claims the man was as pale and as foul as a corpse fresh risen from the grave. Whatever or whoever he might have been, this one-handed shepherd rose up like some malgained spirit, calling down doom and destruction on Queen Rhaenyra to all who came to hear. As tireless as he was fearless, he preached all night and well into the following day, his angry voice ringing across Cobbers Square. Dragons were unnatural creatures, the shepherd declared. Demons summoned from the pits of the seven hells by the foul sorceresses of Valyria. The vile cesspit where brother lay with sister and mother with son, where man rode demons into battle, whilst their women spread their legs for dogs. The Targaryens had escaped the doom, fleeing across the sea to the Dragonstone, but the gods are not mocked, and now a second doom was at hand. The false king and the whore queen shall be cast down, with all their works and their demon beasts shall perish from the earth. The shepherd thundered, all those who stood with them would die as well. Only by cleansing King's Landing of dragons and their masters could Westeros hope to avoid the fate of Valyria. Each hour his crowds grew. A dozen listeners became a score, and then a hundred, and by break of dawn thousands were crowded into the square, shoving and pushing as they strained to hear. Many clutched torches, and by nightfall, the shepherd stood amidst a ring of fire. Those who tried to shout him down were savaged by the crowd. Even the gold cloaks were driven off when 40 of them attempted to clear the square at spear point.